everything in the Lord's Prayer is us. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our sins. Deliver us from evil. We pray together because prayer is a communal thing. It's something we do together. This is the church, God's people on earth, speaking to him and lifting our petitions up together. And so when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray together. And today we close with deliver us from evil. What is evil? Um, you ever see the movie San Andreas? This is the movie that shows what would happen if the big earthquake came to California. And in the movie, everything is, everything is good. Everything's calm at one moment. All is well. Everything's calm and peaceful. And then all of a sudden, the earth cracks beneath you. The ground is shaking beneath your feet. Stuff is falling on top of you. And there's chaos and panic everywhere. And you see, some people in the movie, um, they get hit because of their selfish actions. So they're, they, they push other people away so they can get under the shelter, which then comes down on them. And then other people you see get hit simply randomly because the world is coming apart around them. And so what was once good, what was once calm, what was once peaceful is all of a sudden destructive, destroyed, and chaotic. Dangerous just to be part of. This is, in a spiritual way, this is what sin has done to our world. It's ruined our relationship with God, throwing everything out of kilt. It's ruined our relationship with each other. And it's put all kind of, brought all kind of trouble and sorrow into the world. And some of the stuff we bring on ourselves because of our selfish actions, and some stuff just randomly hits us. Because we live in a world that's being destroyed. Because we live in a world that's coming apart. Because sin and evil have ruined the world around us as well. And so just where we live is dangerous. What can happen to our bodies and souls. So evil, evil includes all the bad things that are part of our life on earth as a result of sin. As a result of that break from God. And first of all, evil threatens our souls, our very life with God. And secondly, evil, evil threatens our bodies, our lives, our property, our health, our reputation. Evil is bad. And yet, what is the question we so often ask? Is sin really so bad? Is sin really so bad? So I've talked, with, um, I've talked with couples that are living together before marriage. And they've said that to me. It, is it really so bad? Come on, everyone else is doing it. And there's financial reasons. Um, it's easier this way. Um, we're, this is how we're going to find out whether we're compatible or not. We're not going to make the same mistakes our parents did. Um, there's children involved, so it'll be messy. Would it really be so bad? I've counseled with women wanting a divorce. I've con I remember uh, counseling a woman uh, wanting a divorce, and her marriage was miserable. Her husband, um, she felt unloved by her husband, who, her, who was cold and uh, disconnected from her. Um, she really wanted out of her marriage. And, and honestly, if I can just be honest, it, it wasn't hard to see why. But I know what Jesus teaches about marriage. I know what Jesus teaches about marriage and, and divorce, and he gives a couple reasons uh, for exceptions, and she didn't have either of those. But would it really be so bad? Would the sin really be so bad? Wouldn't it be worse to continue living with her husband? Is sin so bad? Are the things that Jesus calls sin really so bad? Venting about your boss? Saying, oh my God. Um, what consenting adults do in private. Terminating pregnancies because you're obviously not ready to have children. Talking back to your parents. Spending money on yourself before being generous with others. Not going to church, not wanting to have anything to do with worshiping God. Are these... Sins, are these things that Jesus calls sins really so bad? Is 
sin so bad? You know who teaches us this question? You want to know who teaches us this question? Satan, the one who wants to kill you, the one who wants to kill your trust in God, the one who wants to offer you all kinds of short-term pleasure to kill the long-term pleasure that God wants to give you. That's the one who teaches us this. Um, There's a passage in John that says, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. From the beginning, the devil has been telling us lies to murder all the good things that God wants for us. And he's really good at it. He's really good at it. He has tempted millions of people just like you. He knows what works with egocentric, career-driven men. He knows what works with insecure young women. He knows what works with teenage boys. He knows what works with curious children. He knows what works with you. And he knows exactly just the right times to confront you with that question. Is sin so bad? Wouldn't you be happier if, or wouldn't things work out better for you if? In order to get us to think that sin really isn't so bad, there is really only one lie that he has to convince us of. It's the same lie that convinced King David to commit adultery and then murder. It's the same lie that convinced Hitler to murder millions. It's the same lie that convinced your daughter to lie to you. It's the same lie that has caused every sin in all of history. The lie? God is not good. God is not good. In the Garden of Eden, everything was so good. Everything was perfect in this world that God had made. But then Satan came along to suggest that that maybe God is not good. I mean, why wouldn't he let you eat from that tree? Why would he even have put that tree in the garden? I mean, maybe God is trying to withhold something from you. Or or maybe God is like jealous and insecure and he doesn't want you to be like him. I mean, sure, Adam and Eve, things are good, but Maybe they could be better. (laughs) Maybe God isn't really good. That's the same lie that Satan tries to get us with today. All right? Maybe, Maybe God doesn't really know best for you in your life because maybe God isn't really good. Yeah, maybe things are all right, but maybe, maybe they could be better. In order to get us to wonder, is sin so bad? Satan has to get us to wonder, is God so good? Think of all the things that God says are bad. Getting a divorce just because you're unhappy. Um, Not forgiving someone. We talked about that one recently. Sex outside of marriage, outside of that commitment, that covenant we make to protect such a special blessing. Um not being generous with God, not being generous with others, but using everything for myself, Um, talking back to parents, talking back, having no respect for those God has put over me, using God's name in vain, using God's name in all kinds of different ways to, to suit our own purposes rather than to honor him, killing unborn babies, killing those, um, really just having power and abusing anyone that, that is too weak to do anything about it. And, putting other things ahead of worshiping God, putting anything else in our lives ahead of God in our life who always needs to be first place. People living together uh, without marriage, is it really so bad? A woman wanting a divorce because she's unhappy, is this really so bad? Well, I could think of, I could come up with Bible passages. I can come up with all kinds of practical advice as to why it's so bad, but better yet, better yet, when tempted to do any sin, there's really, it really comes down to asking one question. Is God good? 
when, we, when, we're, when we're face-to-face with any temptation to, to, to go into sin or to do something we know that is, it comes down to asking one question, is he good? Is God good? That's the only question that really matters in these situations because if God is good, then the stuff that God is telling us to do is good. If God is good, then what God wants us to do in our lives is good. There's a passage in James that says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So if every good gift comes from God, if every good and perfect gift comes from God, then if it doesn't come from God, it's not good. And if it does come from God, it is good. Every good gift comes from God. But it's so easy for us to be misled, isn't it? it it's so easy for us to say, well, yeah, but this situation is different. Um, uh, here, God got this one here wrong. It, it's so easy to be led into think that, well, in, in this case, I do know better than God. But the truth is, we can't always see what is good and, and what is evil. And that's why Jesus teaches us to pray, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver, rescue, save us from the belief that you aren't good. Because believing that is where all evil starts. And so rescue us, deliver us, save us from that evil and all the evil that comes out of it. Deliver us from evil. And God loves answering this prayer that he taught us to pray. So how? How does he answer? I, I promised last week that we talk about how God delivers us from evil. So how does God deliver us from evil? First, first way. We're going to talk about four ways. The first way is God warns us. God warns us. So Cain and Abel. You remember way back in the beginning of the Bible, these were the first two sons born to Adam and Eve. And Cain, Cain got very angry and and jealous because God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected his offering. And so God came to Cain to warn him for his own good. God, God came to Cain and said, hey, listen, I know you're upset. I know things didn't turn out how you want. I know you're angry, but it's not too late here. You can still do the right thing here. And God said this, if, but if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. So Cain, a, a, a beast, is about to destroy you. It, it, wants to, it wants to kill you. Don't walk through that door. Be careful what you do next. But Cain, Cain ignored the warning, and he opened that door. And then evil ruined his life. Look what had happened to him. The rest of his life was changed because he walked through that door. But God had been warning him. So looking back on your life, can you see how, how can you see ways that, that God was getting your attention, trying to get your attention and to warn you from evil and harm to your soul? Heard the story about a guy who, there was a guy who was getting ready to divorce his wife, not for a good reason, and, and uh, and he went to church one Sunday, and, and the preacher, it just happened, the preacher started the sermon by saying, I'm going to say something that's going to make all of you probably pretty uncomfortable because you don't think that God hates anything. But actually, the Bible says that God hates divorce. And just at that moment, that guy just got up and walked right out of church. Well, years later, after a painful and, and messy divorce, he was kind of brought back to his knees and his senses, and he went back and he found a recording of that sermon that he had missed that day, and he he listened. And he listened as the preacher explained that just as a a father hates cancer because of what it does to his child, our Heavenly Father hates divorce because of what it does to his children. And the man cried as as he really felt that the preacher was describing exactly what had happened ever since in his life, since that point. Sometimes on Sundays, um, people will come up to me after and say something like, oh, were you spying on me this week? Were you, did you, were you like videotaping uh, my house? It's a little creepy, Pastor. Because, because the message said something that I needed to hear. 
that you couldn't know, that you couldn't have known. And like I, I'm always like I have no idea. See, God's word always speaks right into our lives when we need to hear it the most. That's that's not that's that's something that God does. God has a way of using His word to get our attention. God has a way of using His word to warn us from the evil that would be so harmful and destructive to our souls. So that's um, the first way that God delivers us from evil. He warns us. The second way is this. He keeps evil away from us. So he keeps, we're going we're gonna to talk about a couple different ways. He keeps evil away from our bodies. He keeps evil away from our souls. And then just keeps evil from all around us. So the first is sometimes he keeps evil away from our bodies. Uses angels. This is what angels are for. So from that psalm we are reading, it says, Then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So more often, more often than we would ever know, God keeps evil from harming us. This is a whole sermon in and of itself, all the different ways. I'm sure you have your stories. We think of the hurricane that could have hit us and didn't. We think of the accident we could have had and, and didn't. Um, but God sometimes delivers our bodies using his angels and keeps us from evil to our bodies and our lives. But another way that God keeps evil away from us, especially from our souls. He uses the Holy Spirit to keep evil away from our souls. So there's a, there's a well-known preacher who, and he, t- and he tells this story, there's a well-known preacher. He, he had been traveling for a while. So he's a pastor, he's a preacher, he's traveling, um, speaking and leading groups and, and all these things, but he's on the road for a long time and staying in hotels and he's getting, he's getting tired, he's getting worn out, he's getting lonely. And one night after a long, long day, he's taking his, the elevator to his sixth floor hotel room. And just before the elevator door closes, two young, attractive, flirtatious women get in the elevator with him. Just being a gentleman, he, he asks, what floor? And smiling at him, they look at the lit up button and say, well, the sixth floor sounds pretty good temptation to do evil. He writes about it. Here's what he said. He wrote, I was all alone. I was flattered since people wouldn't often see me as attractive. But these women were available and I was lonely. So thoughts attacked me. Would it be so bad? No one has to know. I'll never see them again. This is just a break from the loneliness, an hour of pleasure. Will it be so bad? But then God put a Bible verse in his head from Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And with that, he went straight back to his room and locked the door. God delivered him from evil. God rescued his marriage, his his family, his ministry, his, his, his conscience, his life by reminding him of these words of Scripture. The Holy Spirit kept him away from evil with those words. And then God delivers evil from from all around us. There's this awesome story in in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings, where the king of a nation called Aram, he was mad at God's prophet named Elisha. He was really mad, and he wanted to destroy Elisha. So sends his whole army to surround the city where Elisha was at, because he's going to get him. And Elisha, it's just Elisha and his servant, two of them, and Elisha's servant is terrified, looking at all that the army around them. Says, what are we going to do? And Elisha tells him, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Elisha's servant looks around and he sees no one but just him and Elisha. It was just them all alone against the enemy. So then Elisha says, Elisha prays and says, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. So the servant's eyes were open, and now he sees all the heavenly forces surrounding their tiny little army that was surrounding the city. They had nothing to fear. Friends, we have nothing to fear because we have a God who's the most powerful, who delivers us from evil. May he open your eyes to see it. May he open our eyes to see it. God opened his eyes to see that, that, he's, that he's living to impress others. And it's just going to lead to emptiness. 
God opened her eyes to see that 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 what she desires is going to be really harmful for her soul. God opened our eyes to see the pride that has blinded us, to see the, the sin that has hardened us, to see, to see the, the lies that have deceived us, <laughs> deliver us from evil. So God keeps evil away from us. The third way that God delivers us from evil is that he makes it work for our good. Maybe this is a passage you've heard before from Romans 8. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So, so sometimes, uh, sometimes a parent lets a kid get chicken pox, right? Why? Because the parent knows that when they get older, it's going to be a lot worse. So they know it would be best for them to get it when they're younger, so they let them get it. Sometimes God allows something bad, something evil to happen to us because he's going to use it to work out for our good. Think about Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. God used that to save the lives of many people. Think about Jesus. God let him die on the cross. But he used that to save the lives of the world. And so sometimes God lets evil happen to us, but he makes it work for our good. The fourth way that God delivers us from evil is that he delivers us from all evil at the end of time. So there's a passage in 2 Timothy that says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. And this is what gives us hope as we pray, deliver us from evil. Because God, he will. He will. So as we pray this prayer, we don't have to be wondering, oh, is God going to do this? He will. At the end of time, he's delivering us from all evil. And so we can have hope knowing that God is is going to keep this prayer. But if we are going to believe that evil is something we need to be delivered from, if we are going to believe that, that sin is truly so bad, then God has to convince us that he is indeed so good. And if God can convince us of his infinite goodness, then we can never doubt sin's badness. And so that God sends us Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate proof that God is so good. If you believe in Jesus, then you have to confess that God is good. Think about it. If, if, you, if you were God, if you were God and you showed up in the Garden of Eden right after Adam and Eve fell into sin, what would you say? If you were God and showed up in the Garden of Eden right after Adam and Eve fell into sin, right after, when you would see all the evil that was going to come from that, what would you say? When, when, when you would see now all of the hatred and the murders and the wars and the holocaust and the miscarriages and the divorces and the, the child abuse and the hurt and the pain and all of the evil that would come from that, when, if, you would, if you were God and see all the evil that would happen because they didn't trust you, what would you have said? What did God say? God looked at Satan and said, I'm going to deliver them. At great cost to myself, I'm going to deliver them. There's going to be a child born of the woman who's going to crush your head. I'm going to fix everything that you broke here, Satan. If God said that, how could we ever doubt that he is good? How could we ever question that God is good if that's what God said when we didn't trust in him? We've asked, is sin so bad? We've gone our own ways. We have continually and repeatedly thought that our ways are, are better than God's ways. And yet God has said to us again and again and again, I forgive you. I love you. Even when we question his goodness, Jesus comes down from heaven and dies for our badness. So, do you wonder if God is good? Just look at Jesus on the cross. You're going to see a God who, who was willing to come down to earth so you could go to heaven. A God who is willing to die so that you could live. A God who is willing to go through hell so you could spend an eternity in heaven. And Satan, Satan gets us to question, is this God good? That lie just doesn't work when you're looking at the cross. What do you mean? This God? This God isn't good? You mean the one who's like giving his life for us? The one who's taking our sins away? The one who's making us perfect? The one who's giving up everything so we could have everything? That God isn't good? Devil? Really? 
At the cross, that lie is just obviously a lie. At the cross, God proves how good he is. God proves that he is good. So, so we will never doubt that sin is bad. Because if God is good, sin is bad. If God is good, sin is bad. So if, if, if the reason that we love God's rules is because we know that God has still loved us even though we've broken his rules a lot of times. And so when we look at the cross, we, we see a God who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. We hear God say, I forgive you. I keep no record of your wrongs. I love you. And so we believe that God is good. And therefore, we believe that what God tells us to do is good. And so when we have that in mind, when we're, when we're thinking about the cross, when we're thinking about how much God loves us, and we run into that woman who we know who is thinking about getting that divorce because she's unhappy, the thing is we will sympathize with her. Uh, our heart will go out to her. And we will be able to sympathize with her and say, I know it seems better to walk away. But I also know that's not what God wants. And I know that God is good. Or we'll be talking to our friends or living together, um, and, and, and we'll be remembering that God is good, and we'll be able to sympathize with them and say, I know it makes sense. I know it's easier this way, but I know that's not what God wants. And I know that God is good. And so when you are face-to-face with temptation to do evil, and you're wondering, maybe God isn't good, look at the cross. Look at the cross with Jesus giving his life for us and say, you know, I don't know about that, but I know about this. And I know that this God is most certainly good. He delivered you from evil by taking all your sins away. He has delivered you from evil by forgiving you for all your sins. And he will deliver us from all evil once and for all at the end of time. So in the meantime, in the meantime, he lets us pray to him. He wants us to pray to him. He invites us to pray to him, to talk to him. In fact, he even taught us how to pray to him. He gave us a model. He gave us a template. We call it the Lord's Prayer, the best prayer ever. So let's pray to our Heavenly Father who loves us, who is good, who gives us what is good, who delivers us from evil, all because of Jesus and all in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, you are good. Help us never doubt that. Because you are good, we know sin is bad. And so deliver us from it. Deliver us from all the harm that it gives into our lives, in our bodies, our families, our property, our, our souls, but especially the evil and the harm that it does to our souls. Keep us far away from it. Warn us with your word. Strengthen us. But remind us daily of your love and how good you are by being willing to give up what was most precious to give us life with you forever. So, Lord, Father, deliver us from evil and help us always to come to you, the one who always wants what's good for us, in prayer to ask your blessing and your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.